Hello all and welcome. It is with great pleasure that I am joining you to host the sixth annual event for Black History Month put on by the Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora. Tonight's event, Word Sound Power, is the second of its kind put on by the Chair. We are grateful to Unifor for this fourth year of funding which has made this event possible. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the land we share. As this event is virtual and we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Takaranto's intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land. Indigenous peoples from other territories, as well as white settlers and those people who have come here by force or otherwise, as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. As the descendant of Africans formerly enslaved in the Americas who were taken from their ancestral lands against their will, I am committed to what Tiffany King calls a notion of mutual care. And I recognize that a future for Black peoples is not possible without a future for Indigenous peoples, by whose leave I live, walk on, and share this land. I acknowledge, finally, that these Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us when we enter any room, any virtual space, and we must bring them into this view. With this knowledge of history, we enter here in the hope of making a different world. Did you know that it was only 26 years ago, in 1995, that the Honorable Jean Augustine, who in 1993 was the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to Canada's federal parliament, moved a motion in the House of Commons for Black History Month to be officially recognized in Canada. This motion was unanimously supported by all federal parliamentarians. I view this month as an opportunity to reflect and discuss with one another as well as allies on where we are and what is still yet to be done to support Black people in Canada. With this in mind and recognizing what seems to be an awakening to Black realities and anti-Black racism, it is my hope that you will all enjoy tonight's performances and reflect on the fact that while this event does take place during Black History Month, Black artistic expression is not confined to just February, nor is Black history or Black experiences. This evening, we will be graced with an abundance of Canadian Black talent through the power of music and words to amplify the beauty and relevance of Black artistic expression. We'll journey together, embracing oral traditions grounded in our pre-colonial history through music, gospel, jazz, and R&B, and with spoken word artists whose voices ring deeply calling us to pause and ponder our Black experiences of the past, present, and our future. So without further delay, let's begin the evening with a few words from Dr. Robert Savage, the Dean of the Faculty of Education here at York University. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Savage, the Dean of the Faculty of Education, and it is my privilege to welcome you to our annual Black History Month BHM event and as I'm delighted to say, presented by the Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora. This evening's event, Word Sound Power, a celebration of black artistic expression, will feature thought-provoking performances by the York R&B Ensemble and Oscar Peterson Scholarship Ensemble under the direction of Mike Cado, the York University Gospel Choir under the direction of Karen Burke, as well as spoken word artists from Griots to MCs. 
I was not a member of the faculty in 2019 when this particular iteration of our Black History Month celebration occurred. From what I've heard, it was exceptional. We are also in, I understand, for some spectacular performances tonight. At this time, I'd like to welcome a few special guests who we have with us tonight. The Honourable Gina Augustine, who in 1995 single-handedly championed the unanimous vote in Parliament to officially designate February as Black History Month in Canada. I would also like to welcome Christine Macklin, Human Rights Director at Unifor, who are the main sponsor of this event. On behalf of the Faculty of Education, I'd like to extend a thank you to Unifor for their continued support of the Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora. Their support allows us to put on our annual BHM event every February and to also further the work of the Jean Augustine Chair through a variety of planned events throughout the year. I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the Schools of Art, Media, Performance and Design and the Department of Humanities for their support of this event and acknowledge their role in helping to organise tonight's event. Black History Month gives us a time to recognise the accomplishments, contributions and histories of black people in Canadian society and to note the social justice work that remains to be completed. It also provides an opportunity for me to note here the importance I attach to creating space for us to reflect on how we will build black inclusion and black thriving into the fabric of our functioning as a faculty through the active decolonizing, rebuilding and the energetic and principled actions we undertake together now and into the future. At this time, I would like to turn it over to the Honourable Jean Augustine to say a few words. Greetings to all. Dean Savage, thank you. Greetings to Dr. Carl James, his colleagues in the Jean Augustine Chair, all those who are participating this evening as we celebrate in this Black History Month, as we mark this Black, this annual Black History Month event, celebration of Black artistic expression. I salute the York uh, Gospel Choir, the R&B Ensemble, the Spoken Word Poets, the Oscar Peterson Ensemble, and all those who are part of this evening's event. I thank UNIFOR for the support to the Jean Augustine Chair. I also want to remind everyone, although it was said that it was my motion 25, 26 years ago, 1995, that designated February as Black History Month in Canada. And Black History Month is about honoring, is about celebrating the enormous contributions that Black people have made and continue to make in all sectors of society. The talent, the skills, the expertise, and all that we showcase in this month is but the beginning of everything that we will do for the rest of the year. Black History Month theme from the Canadian government is celebrate today and uh, every day. So let's celebrate, let's enjoy tonight's evening and let's revel in the contributions that we will see this evening. Thank you. So much of the last two years have been marked by catastrophe and suffering. More than five and a half million people have died from the COVID-19 global pandemic. And we know that there will be still more losses, too many for us to fully comprehend, too much for us to grieve alone. Alongside the isolation and fear produced by the pandemic, we witness the outpouring of another kind of collective grief as ordinary people across their differences, black, white, brown, young, old, Muslim and Christian, poured into streets and public spaces, putting their bodies at risk in the midst of a pandemic in defense of black life. As black people have mourned their historical and contemporary losses, 
We've also been required to remember the losses of Indigenous communities in Canada as we counted the bodies of Indigenous children recovered from the sites of former residential schools. As Canada and the rest of the world now hurries to move beyond the pandemic and to forget, we know that Black people's survival is dependent on our ability to remember, to invoke memory as a critical practice of learning that marks our journeys across the globe and honors those who have fought before us so we can live. Since 2018, the Jean Augustine Chair in Education, Community and Diaspora, an endowed university chair established by the Honorable Jean Augustine and led by Carl James, has been involved in research and community work committed to advancing Black people's lives in Canada, bringing university and community partners together to address problems affecting Black youth and communities from the perspective of Black people themselves. These partnerships include most recently the Jean Augustine Canadian Youth Initiatives Research and Data Hub, supported by a grant from the Royal Bank of Canada in which researchers from York University, McMaster, Dalhousie, and the University of British Columbia are working with Black and other racialized youth to better understand the challenges of high school and provide youth with opportunities that support their educational and social success. In addition, each year for five years, the chair has hosted an annual Black History Month event. This year, as we gather for this flagship event, recognizing the losses of the last two years, the members of the organizing committee have chosen to center Black life and Black joy as expressions of Black people's will to live. And so this evening is not about a narration, a re-narration of Black struggle and Black pain. Description, Catherine McKittrick explains, is not liberation. And for historian Saidiya Hartman, beauty is not a luxury. It is a way of creating possibility in the space of enclosure, a radical act of subsistence, an embrace of our terribleness, a transfiguration of the given. This evening, therefore, we purposefully hold space for Black voices Black music and Black art, as York University students and community artists and activists offer a refusal of the anti-Black logics that are determined to silence them and us, that are predicated on their and our demise. Within the African diaspora, Shauna Redmond notes, music functions as a method of rebellion, revolution, and future visions that disrupt and challenge the manufactured differences used to dismiss, detain, and destroy communities. It is a vital method of participation within Black people's freedom dreams and liberation projects. The musical and poetic offerings you will hear this evening are about Black people sound in life as they know it, life as they make it. These offerings tell us that gospel music is as foundational to Black community life as R&B and hip hop. Black for performance poetry is another kind of music, another kind of freedom dream, giving us a glimpse into the deep interior and sacred spaces of Black life. Black people's livingness is the revolution. The Jean Augustine Chair thanks you so much for joining us in this spectacular marking of Black people's enduring presence 
in this country and in this hemisphere. Yeah.
Hi, my name is Juanita Mwanga, and my spoken word piece is inspired by events that have happened throughout history, events that are happening today in our backyards, and events that have been taking place in front of our eyes over social media and the news. This piece is called, This True North is Strong, But Not Free. I had thoughts of freedom, tales that entail stories of self-dignity, not lost equality, body of the soul over the soul and the body, entitlement to the gift of places, things, and people like a hangman game, hung, disciples in the century of modern Babylon, line execution to the believer of good thoughts, fear only to the clouds and stars beyond even that. The heart lies, oh, the mind too. Situations to a pig's world, black and blue on red and white, dark like the skin of soul man, unbruised. Have you heard it? Time has tick, tick tock to the sounds of the March of February. Hearts of my human race broke into the belief of equality. Serpents to the misconception of freedom. Fight to free murdered souls that ships held captive on waves of anger. God's revenge. Isn't that why my mother's tears taste like sea salt? Peace. Felt words the deaf can see and the poor man seek. Say bye to peace. For where is she? What is she? I have lost sight of what peace is and unfamiliar with how to even stretch my fingers across such distance. Gang signs and colors? Now that I know, only for the sake of the mathematics of survival, is it in the block where the glocks ring shot cause rings of Bishop T.D. Jake's Sunday bells are too far away and too far removed, or perhaps too hard to believe. But then again, Nas is God's son, right? So if heaven is only a mile away, this would be hell. My immigrant parents ran away from the belly of the beast, well known to the silent cries behind closed doors among many Africans where ethnic cleansing and racial tensions are among those who do and do not share the same skin tone. And the depletion of the economy is due to poor governance and its leaders' rotting disease of corruption. This is why they fled to bear arms to a new battle. It's the S's and R's and L's in my father's Ugandan post-secondary linguistics and the scents that fill the air of my mother's frankincense dripped over her clothes and skin as she walks through each and every no-frills aisle. So in the land of the free, they've learned that their children still must fight. I can't even hear my screams in this city of so many forgotten dreams. And I cannot fathom conformity for outward politeness makes me inwardly sick. The system is something we must fight our way out of and no longer be entrenched by, neither in Mama Africa or Sir Canada. So I, double dog dare you, to dream. Sitting right there, allow your wildest assumptions to be lived reality, where race, gender, or sexuality won't make you feel like other or prevent you from entering spaces. Where taking up space isn't a concept needed to be expressed where stories are shared rather than buried, only to come up 751 times. This true north is strong, but not free. The teachers say he looks three years older than his age, so they won't tolerate it when he runs around and plays. His teacher made a box around his desk with masking tape, and within that square foot is where he stays. 
His mom noticed now he glues his arms to his side. And when he gets out of bed in the morning, he just cries. Let me tell you about another black child. They sent her home with a note saying her hair looks wild. The teacher took scissors to cut off her braids. Now she won't go to school because she's too afraid. They feel like they're lesser because of their shade and they haven't even passed the first grade. And there's a five-year-old girl whose teacher had enough, so she called the police to take her from class in handcuffs. I could tell you of Nova Scotia roads in a yellow school bus taking black kids to school where they don't feel the love. And they sit in a group in the cafeteria while the white kids taught them go back to Nigeria and they learn white superior and they are inferior, no black books on the curriculum, so their history is mysterious. Trauma is seated. For centuries it flows. They called the savage and beast shackled us in the holds, enslaved and then brought here to die in the cold. Segregated schools are histories untold, so I could tell of generations carrying the load. Children given sin numbers by the time they were 13 years old. I can tell of Pocahontas and little black Sambo, our communities stripped of our Edisons and Van Goghs and white people surround us wherever we go, from the awards on the wall to the scientists they show so I can speak of the impacts and how they unfold when we're treated as other outside our household. Never taught that chemistry comes from chemet, meaning the art of the black or that the Greeks went to Africa when they wanted to learn math. One month a year is all that they have. Then the teachers say they just don't pay attention in class. They say aliens built the pyramids and not our engineering. They say white people freed the slaves and not us disappearing. They say Africa can't survive without white saviors interfering. And then they wonder why black students just don't feel like persevering. Bad hair day, wearing a head wrap. Teachers roamed the hallways in old Canada saying, take off your hats. Only black kids kicked out in the hall when they chat. Then they wonder why black kids wear headphones at the back. They didn't care about his attendance during basketball season. But now the championships won. They don't need a reason. If you can run with a ball, they don't care about reading. Then you blow out a knee and there's nothing left to believe in. White privilege is your history being central and mine being an elective. It's you being the norm and me being a perspective. It's when I talk about my experience, you say I'm being negative. It's when you say that I'm angry, attitude, or aggressive. It's my schools having police. It's the gap in the test saying we can't achieve. It's always being judged by what someone else perceives, and then they blame Black kids when the Black kids leave. And I hear from my young brothers and sisters, who say they're surrounded by racist whispers. It only gets attention when it's the N-word or swastikas, but every day in the hallway seems like no one will listen. It's us being less than 1% of the teachers. Black History Month being the only time there's black speakers. Posters on the walls that don't share our features. It's us as the cleaners and them as the leaders. Halloween and their classmates are wearing black face and we're told we have to straighten our hair to fit into the rat race and when it comes to our experiences people just hit backspace and our names do not appear on the trophies in the glass case. Streaming our kids out to never label us gifted and goalposts that we meet just to find they have shifted. Access to programs is always restricted and yet we believe education will lift us. The sword of the oppressed, the downtrodden's night vision, Malcolm X reading the dictionary locked in a prison. So black teachers and black students are joined in our mission to shift our communities from low paid positions to read our histories and authors and change our conditions for young single mothers to get off assistance and move us from cleaners to lawyers or physicians to return to our neighborhoods and start up a business and all of their narratives, we can resist them. We know there's a reason they forbid our ancestors from reading. So every day we are feeding our minds is a day towards freedom. And there are bookstores of just black books that we can be in, mastered in a language they force us to be speaking. 
elevators, traffic lights, those are our inventions. Abolition, civil rights, whole world paid attention. Black youth, more than hidden figures, they forget to mention. And when we're given the tools, you see our ascension from detention to retention to the office of the president. The problem's never us or the breadth of our intelligence. In case it isn't obvious, racism is the elephant. From classrooms to boardrooms, we're told it's not our element. Our youth we know succeed when the curriculum is relevant. And with the right supports, you will follow our development. Just as the mountaintop rises out of the sediment, our youth will overcome. The future is Black excellence.
can throw out all your blues and hit the city lights. Cause there's music in the air and lots of love in everywhere. So give me the night. the night you need the heat in action a place to dine a glass of wine a little vain romance it's a chain reaction you'll see the people of the world coming out to dance cause there's music in the air and lots of love in everywhere so give me the night Come on now tonight, and we'll lead the others on a ride to paradise. And if you feel alright, then we can be lovers, cause I see that starlight look in your eyes. Don't you know we can fly? Taking us up high, never mind the weather. We'll be dancing in the street until the morning light. Cause there's music in the air and lots of love in everywhere. So give me the night.
And I love you, baby, like a flower loves the spring. And I love you, baby, like a schoolboy loves a spray. I love you, baby, rest a deep down tonight. Oh, baby. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. Oh, I love you, you're my. My name is Michaela Blackman and I'm a second year student here at York University. I recently had the opportunity of taking the Griots to MCs class taught by Wendy Bradley. In this class, we are encouraged to express ourselves in ways I have never done before. One of the prompts Wendy gave for a spoken word assignment was to write on something that makes us angry. When I think of what makes me angry, I reflect on my experiences as a student in the Canadian public school system. This is what inspired this piece. What is even more upsetting is that my experiences are not unique. This piece is relevant today as many young immigrant children are still experiencing discrimination, racism, and oppression within our school systems. The futures of Black immigrant children depends on our ability to speak up about the structures in place to hold us back. Please enjoy. They trying to set us up. Set us up for failure like if they didn't already do enough. Like if these generational curses don't already have us in a rough. Saying crap like, those black boys are too A, aggressive, B, busybodied, C, careless to learn. Like if that isn't normal adolescent behavior. Those black girls are too D, dramatic, E, expressive, F, flirtatious to learn. Like if we weren't just kids. See, Miss Johnson, I know my alphabet. By the way, your school system got me upset. I was doing addition at four, multiplication at five, division at six, bed mass at seven, reading English books at eight, chapter books thicker than the width of my little pinky toe came here and was told, you don't belong here. ESL is what they called it, English as a second language, separate classes, separate work, separate readings, all at a lower level, of course, like if Trinidad wasn't colonized by the British at one point, so trust me, I know English. They trying to set us up. Went from hearing, that girl bright, you know, there's another copy of Judy B. Jones. That's when I understood racism, ignorance, let's call it for what it is, the invisible force that somehow makes me less than my peers, less than in your eyes, undeserving of the life you idealize. They trying to set us up. Whatever happened to equal opportunity? Just another fabricated lie. We know what you're doing, the plans you got brewing. Some call it streaming, pushing us towards ruin. Lower level courses so university wouldn't even be an option. Forced to then take the jobs that are beneath those of your complexion. They trying to set us up, got my people back home, thinking I'm doing better if only they knew yes I'm angry and rightfully so because they tried to set me up it's an honor to follow up on such a powerful piece hi my name is Ryan Burke a poet and I have the privilege of sharing my poem titled black mythical figure with you all tonight myth the definition reads a widely held but false belief or idea sort of like the many ideals perceived by those who do not know me. So I'm pointing first at society, or maybe even media, as either way the two go hand in hand, as both are desperately in need of some sort of story to continue their portrayal of me. Yet every time I walk by them, I'm sensing an urgency, one that's filled with tighter security as they take two steps away from either side of me. And if chance avails, then across the street is where they find their safety. Not to mention the car alarm symphonies that always seem to play when I walk the block. Tick, tock, up, down, as I turn and hear the sound and see the locks drop, pop, lock. Oh my, 
God, he's just all in black with dread locks. Quick, someone, please call the cops. The irony behind that incident was that my outfit was all white, but by sight, she saw my melanin skin and used it as a creative descriptor to let them know who was amongst their presence. The mythological boogeyman. God damn. He's a thug. He sells drugs. He's probably part of a gang, but my brothers tell me, chill, it's not all bad. Oh yeah, I forgot. There's also the benefit of the many rebellious women who ask me stupid questions like, have you ever held a gun? Do you have one? Killed anyone? Or whisper in my ear. Is it true what they say? Are all black men hung? Now taking in the bitter smell of Southern strange fruit and the roots by which many were killed. As she tells me, she loves me, but I know better still I shudder because I have many friends who once resided in penitentiaries for either denying or getting caught in the act of fulfilling these girls' fantasies. You see, it's a dream come true that you are the rebellious tool used by Rebecca and Keisha one for cultural reasons, the other spiritual and habitual, but mainly to impress friends or annoy family, and that's the reality, with no expense to them, but all at the cost of a black heart, the disconnect to love's intimate feeling towards others and self, and no open arms to run to or outstretch hands offering help, just past notions of how you need to always be strong, even though you desire to let the pain out through tears that need to fall but you managed to somehow get them to defy the theory of relativity, both in their general and special formalities. One mind with multiple theories, many voices equating to multiple personalities, two lips with silence becoming the native tongue I used to speak, and no validity to their beliefs, now a lost identity to which I continue to play hide and seek. Tell me this isn't trauma. Tell me this isn't PTSD. Tell me why when I was asked what's one of the biggest cons of being a Black man in society, I was laughed out of the room by my own people when I said, it's the obsession with my masculinity. An image they fear, demonize, and fantasize, but will never learn to love. And sometimes I have to wonder, will I ever again learn to love what I see? I wanna thank you all. You're in for a real treat, as up next is a musical performance by the Oscar Peterson Scholarship Ensemble.
Happy Black History Month, everyone. My name is Christine Macklin. I'm the Unifor National Human Rights Director, and I am truly humbled to be sending messages and greetings on behalf of my union. As a Black woman, I know the importance of recognizing our history. It's so important to recognize the success and the accomplishments and the legacy that Black leaders have paved the way for us to be where we are right now. There's a quote by a phenomenal woman. It says, History has shown us that courage is contagious and hope can take on a life of its own. You are hope. We are hope. And it's about the changes and everything that we do. I'm really honored because I got these beautiful earrings from another phenomenal Black woman in my union. And it says, I am Black history. Whew. What a responsibility. But I want you to know that I am taking on that responsibility, that you can take on that responsibility. And together, we will pave a history that future generations will be able to look back and say, wow, this is our time. Every single day of the year, we will be Black history. So thank you, and I send my greetings on behalf of Unifor as a national union. Happy Black history. Thank you to all the amazing performers tonight and to all of you joining the Jean Augustine Chair for Word, Sound, Power, Black Artistic Expression. We look forward to seeing you all again next year. Have a great evening. <laughs>